Hi, everybody. My name is Neil Seidman, and I'm co-chair of the Public Education Committee for ADAA, that's the Anxiety and Depression Association of America. And welcome to our webinar. It's called Outsmart Your Anxious Brain. And our presenter is Dr. David Carbonell. So these webinars are presented by the Anxiety and Depression Association of America, which is the leading nonprofit in the field of anxiety and depression. And our mission is to improve diagnosis and really facilitate the prevention, treatment, and eventually the cure of many of these conditions related to anxiety, depression, stress-related disorders. Uh, we feature education like this webinar, and the organization also supports research and uh, training for therapists, practitioners. Uh, I wanna invite everybody to really take advantage of all the resources on our website. It's really a fantastic website. So that's adaa.org. And right from the homepage, uh, there's uh, a resource called Find a Therapist, which is a great uh, directory of treatment providers. We also have a free peer-to-peer -peer, uh, support group online. And then finally, <clears throat> if you have a question uh, after watching the webinar, uh, feel free to send an email with your question to webinars at adaa.org. And then finally, uh, you can support ADAA by making a charitable donation on the website. Okay, so let's get started. I'm really happy to introduce our presenter. Dr. David Carbonell is a clinical psychologist. He specializes in treating anxiety. And he's the author of four really wonderful self-help books. And you can see the titles here, The Panic Attacks Workbook, The Worry Fear of Flying Workbook, and the book that we're gonna talk about today, Outsmart Your Anxious Brain, 10 Simple Ways to Beat the Worry Trick. Dr. Carbonell is the coach of a really popular self-help site, which is called anxietycoach.com. That's anxietycoach.com. Uh, Dr. Carbonell has actually taught workshops on how to treat anxiety disorders for more than 10,000 therapists uh, in the US and around the world. Originally received his doctorate in clinical psychology from DePaul University in Chicago in 1985. And since 1990, he's maintained a practice devoted to treating anxiety disorders in Chicago. And by the way, in his spare time, Dr. Carbonell is the founding member of the Therapy Players, an improvisational comedy troupe of professional psychotherapists in the Chicago area. So let me turn things over now to Dr. Carbonell as we'll switch our screens. Excellent, coming through great. Welcome, welcome, Dave. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you, Neil. Thanks for having me. Uh, always look forward to doing something like this. <clears throat> and so today I'm going to uh, talk with you a little bit about, about my new book uh, and the materials therein, to Outsmart Your Anxious Brain. And uh, the, the, the reason I, I wrote this book was after writing the others, uh, the Panic Attacks Workbook and the Worry Trick in particular, it, it became apparent to me in talking with, with readers and talking with clients that Gee, there was still a, a need out there, still a hunger out there for uh, something more direct, something more, even more boiled down. Can you just give us a, 
a, a formula, an idea of exactly what to do. Give us, give us more steps and less description. And so that, that's what this book is all about. This is probably as concrete and as direct as, as I could have made it. Uh, 10 simple steps to, to use and coming to grips with panic and anxiety and, and worry. Uh, so that, that's the book. Uh, so I, uh, what I'd like to do today is just, uh, you know, quickly touch on the highlights of, of the book, uh, uh, highlights of each chapter or some of the chapters, see how, how much time we have. Uh, and thinking about chapter one, uh, it goes to this question, why don't people just get better on their own uh, when they're struggling with an anxiety disorder? Uh, why, for instance, does somebody with, with panic disorder after they've had seven or 17 or 49 panic attacks, maybe come to recognize, gee, each time I get terrified and I think I'm about to have a catastrophe, I'm about to faint, I'm about to collapse or go crazy, uh, and then it passes. Um, what prevents people from noticing that pattern and, and getting better on their own? And understand, I don't think they would or, or expect that they should, but we wanna know why that doesn't happen. That's gonna tell us a lot about uh, what people need to help themselves. And here, the reason it doesn't happen is people literally get tricked by their reliance on a variety of safety behaviors uh, that prevent them from coming to be able to see through the panic. Uh, so give, me, give us some examples of what, what do you mean, what would be an example of a safety behavior if I have one of these anxiety disorders and I'm trying to get better on my own and you're saying, well, these safe behaviors might be an obstacle for me. Yeah, well, let, let's think about somebody maybe who's uh, afraid of panicking in an elevator. Uh, and so they, they go out to try and deal with the elevator and they have a lot of anxiety about it ahead of time, of course, and they, they step into the elevator and they're anxious and they, they, they push the button for two and, and maybe seven seconds later, the elevator arrives on the second floor and then they step out. And now I feel better out here. It's better out here than in the elevator. And so they, in some ways, they feel like they've been rescued by getting away from the elevator. Who knows what would have happened if I had stayed on that elevator? Maybe I would have had a calamity. So there, there we see how avoidance fools people about what might happen. Uh, or perhaps they, they go driving. Uh, they're afraid of particular kinds of roads, maybe afraid of a highway. Um, and because they have with them maybe a, a, a cell phone, uh, a water bottle, uh, maybe an emotional support animal, uh, they're wearing their lucky shirt, they get tricked into thinking, I was okay because I had that. And, and God forbid what happens if I, my, my cell phone malfunctions or my water bottle springs a leak. Uh, the only thing that's keeping me right is those objects. So when you so think you're okay, yeah. So these behaviors and objects that I'm using to help me manage, uh, you're saying can be tricking me because they're preventing me from learning something. Yes. Yeah. They're literally preventing you from learning that, gee, I can be okay even when I get anxious. Uh, that it's nice to have the water bottle or, or the pictures of my grandkids there. Uh, and maybe that makes me a little more comfortable, but you know what? It doesn't really make me any safer. I'm already as safe as I can be. Uh, and, and so even though then they get through the episode each and every time, they can't take any credit for it. If they bring a support person with them, this is a particularly uh, difficult one. Uh, I have my support person with me when I go on the highway. Uh, or when I drive at night or when I do whatever I'm afraid of. And now I'm going to come to attribute all the success, all the power to my support person and not to me. And so the longer people continue to rely on a support person over time, the more anxious and dependent they come to be because they can't take credit for their successes. So this is part of the answer to the question, why people don't get better on their own. Absolutely, absolutely, because uh, the reliance on, on the safety objects leads them to continue to believe that they're more vulnerable than they actually are. 
And if I didn't have my safe person or my object or my safety behavior, whatever it might be, then I'm thinking this would be bad if I didn't have yes. this to save me. Absolutely. And that's the only reason I escaped the catastrophe. Right. So that, that's, not, that's not a reassuring idea. That, that, no. That's not a comforting idea. Uh, people sometimes go so far as to attribute their survival in a moment of high anxiety to luck. How did, how did you get through that episode? I was lucky, they'll say. Uh, well, we all know, I think, don't we, that each and every one of us is born with a certain amount of luck. Uh, and now I just use some up. So how do I feel going forward? I feel worse because it's bringing me closer to that day when I'm going to literally be out of luck. So yeah. anything else, anything external to which people attribute their being okay, their surviving, their coping, uh, tends to subvert their own ability to realize, hey, I can handle this. Okay. So in, in, in treatment, we're going to uh, look to help people develop a good inventory of the safety behaviors and gradually let go of all of them so that they can I take see. credit for what they do. Okay, and I'll be able to have some other things I can do instead to help me. Yes, yes, ab absolutely. Some other things to cope with the anxiety, not with, uh, you know, what, what appear to be the, the thoughts of, of death and disaster and so on, but I'm going to get really nervous and I'll have some ways to cope with that anxiety. Right. Now, your next point on the slide is talking about thoughts. Oh, the... Oh, oh, sorry, I jumped ahead of you. That's okay. Yeah. Uh, my relationship with thoughts. Yes, yes. Um, of course, it, it's uh, so, so common for people to have uh, anxiety producing, uh, anxious thoughts of some kind of a disaster when they're getting really anxious. So a person preparing to make a, a, a drive on a highway or preparing to board an airplane well, they're likely to be filled with thoughts about all the awful things they might suppose might happen on the highway or on board the airplane. And uh, so a person might you know, have thoughts, gee, what if I uh, just uh, start acting crazy at the, at the wheel um, and, and I, I just flip out and become a dangerous driver? Or what if I faint uh, while I'm sitting on the airplane? They're going to take the content of those thoughts really seriously and think that it's some kind of a warning. Oh, no, maybe I'm likely to faint now. Oh, no, maybe I'm likely to go crazy now. When well, shouldn't, I, shouldn't I, in a situation like that, shouldn't I be taking those scary thoughts seriously? I mean, aren't they important? You know, for the most part, they're not. Uh, when I work with somebody who has those thoughts, I'm going to ask them, well, what, what's been your history? How many times have you gone crazy so far? Uh, what's your history with fainting? How many times have you fainted when you became anxious? Not felt lightheaded, not thought you were going to faint. How many times have you fainted? And as people review their history, their actual history with these thoughts, what they're going to come to see is that these thoughts aren't predictions of something bad that's going to happen. These thoughts are simply symptoms of being anxious. That these thoughts mean the same thing as sweaty palms. I'm anxious. That's what these thoughts mean. When I start thinking about fainting, it means I'm anxious. And when I start thinking about screaming and running through the mall, it means I'm anxious. It's not a prediction of something I'm going to do it's in the future. It's a way of me being anxious right now. And that's how I want to help people respond to those thoughts not as predictions of a catastrophe, uh, as ways of being anxious right now. It means the same thing as sweaty bombs. So what I'm hearing is that one of the keys uh, is instead of continuing to take my anxious thoughts so seriously, to just maybe allow this idea or consider the idea of maybe shifting my relationship with these anxious thoughts, like you're saying here, an anxious thought is a sign that I'm feeling nervous, not a not a prediction of something that's actually going to be happening. Yes, and and so how I want to relate to them is 
uh, I want to relate to them as me being nervous rather than me being in danger. Okay. okay. So, so we have two central ideas here in these first two chapters. The first one is the business of uh, looking at the safety behaviors and the relationship I have with thoughts that keeps me a, a good candidate for experiencing the anxiety. Uh, and the second one, terribly important, um, it's, the, it's based on this. A person's gut instinct of what to do when they're experiencing panic or a moment of high anxiety, uh, their instinctive idea of what to do is almost always dead wrong. Dead wrong, 180 degrees kind of dead wrong, kind of astonishing. Uh, and in one sense, that's the good news uh, because it's like having a, a compass that's off by 180 degrees. I have a compass that when it points north, it calls it south. Well, that's a problem. That, that's a problem. But you know what, if I know that, I can still use that compass to find my way home. I just have to remember when it says north, it means south. And, and uh, the instincts people have when they're having a panic attack, almost always 180 degrees off of the mark uh, of, of what to do. They'll clutch the, uh, the armrest of an airplane. Well, you know what, that's what you have a seatbelt for. The seatbelt is gonna hold you in the seat. You don't need to be clutching the armrest. It's not making you any safer. It is making you more tense. They'll hold their breath during a panic attack. Well, that's not really going to help. Uh, but across the board, people's gut instinct of what to do is almost always dead wrong. Not because there's anything wrong with them. Not because they're stupid. Not because they're uninformed. Not because they're afraid or weak or anything. Because panic and high anxiety inevitably elicits ideas from people that will maintain the panic and anxiety rather than subdue it. So for example, if I'm experiencing high anxiety or panic and I have my gut instinct to uh, run back home or call a support person or do something that's going to relieve my anxiety, are you saying that that's not a good, uh, I should be doing the opposite? Oh, certainly running back home. Uh, well, you, you'll get you'll get back home and you'll be okay. But then you're going to come to believe that the only reason you're okay is because you ran away, uh, that it was really dangerous back there. Whereas if you had some uh, approach that let you stay there and and work with the fear, then you would come to see, gee, I'm okay even though I stayed and let myself be afraid. Uh, somebody who, like who's go ahead. Sorry. As somebody who's afraid maybe of having a panic attack while they're driving, uh, they've probably got their fingers clutched in a death grip around that wheel. All 10 of them as tight as they can. Well, you don't really need all 10 fingers on the wheel that way to drive. If, if you can remember back to your learning to drive in high school or whenever it was, uh, there was what, the 11 o'clock and 4 o'clock or something like that, a light touch on the wheel. They got all 10 fingers clutched on that wheel and they feel more anxious because of that. So, well, let me let me start small with rule of opposites here. I'm going to relax the weakest finger, the smallest finger of my weak hand. I'll take my left hand pinky off the wheel and see if that's okay. And if that's okay, I'll, I'll do the same with my right pinky and then I'll start moving the other fingers. Uh, finding ways to do the opposite of my gut instinct. I like your example of like having a compass, like my my instinct is, so I got to find some relief or clutch harder or avoid something or run to safety. And mm -hmm. I like your illustration of, well, I have a compass. It's just that it's the compass is saying north when actually I need to be going in the opposite direction. Yes, yeah, and this is so reliable so reliable across the board um, with all the very small micro behaviors, the little instinctive moves that people make. This isn't about major changes of direction in life. Should I go to college or not? Should I get married or not? This is about 
small behavioral choices that people make in the high moment of, of a panic attack or a moment of high anxiety. Uh, that's when we can find they literally get fooled into doing stuff that they hope is going to help, but that actually makes them feel more afraid. And then so it's, it's going to be a powerful rule of thumb throughout the course of, uh, of recovery. What's my gut instinct when I'm panicking and what would be the opposite of that? Very interesting. So that's uh, well, that's largely what chapter two is about to set that stage. Okay. Uh, the rest of the book. So with, with those two chapters, I limited myself to two explanatory chapters. The rest of the book then covers, here's 10, 10 steps, uh, 10 ways that you can use to help yourself throughout the course of your recovery. So let's see what we've got here. And, and first and foremost uh, uh, is, is the business of breathing. Uh, with most of the anxiety disorders, breathing is an issue, uh, particularly so with panic disorder and, and with social anxiety disorder. People frequently feel as though I can't get an adequate breath. I'm running out of air. Uh, I, I can't catch my breath. And here we can see the rule of opposites apply to something as, as purely uh, biological as breathing. Because what do people do when they have a panic attack? Uh, typically they try and take a deep breath. Uh, and I've heard that from so many people across the years. Uh, I can't catch my breath. What do you do when you can't catch your breath? Well, I try and take a deep breath and it makes them feel worse. So what would be the opposite of trying to take a deep breath? It would be giving, Exhale. Yeah, yeah, literally giving one away. Uh, I don't want to take one first. I want to give one away because I'm already breathing so short and so shallow from the top part of my chest. If I go to take an inhale, well, there's only one kind of inhale I can take at that point. Another short and shallow and labored and uncomfortable inhale. Uh, and I'll get enough air to breathe to live on but it won't ever feel comfortable that way. Uh, and, and so here we can see rule of opposites. What would be the opposite of taking in that deep breath? It would be an exhale or a sigh, simply a sigh uh, that a person can use to relax the muscles of their chest and upper body and, and shoulders. Let those muscles relax them. And now they're in a position to do what they wanted to do in the first place to take a deep breath because because now they can take it from their belly rather than the top of their chest. So this is an example of uh, what you call the rule of opposites and I am desperate to get a good breath. You're saying, well, how about doing the opposite? Let's start with an exhale instead. Exactly. Exactly. And you know, so often people arrive, uh, you know, come to my office, arrive for treatment and, and it's, it's really unfortunate, people with, with panic disorder, they, they frequently have a kind of bad attitude about breathing because so many people have told them in the past, take a deep breath, take a deep breath, and they've tried that and it doesn't work. Uh, it doesn't work to make them more comfortable, they feel less comfortable then. And, and it, it's, it's frustrating and bewildering to them. I try and take a deep breath, but I can't. It's the wrong advice. They should be giving a, a breath away first give the breath away, do the exhale, then you'll find that you can start doing the belly breathing. Um, a really wonderful, I'm, really wonderful practical example that people can start maybe applying just from the webinar uh, mm -hmm. and of, you know, yes, using the compass, but doing the opposite. <laughs> yes, yes. You, you, you take, you know, as, as part of uh, the observing, say, of a panic attack or a moment of high anxiety, uh, I'd like for people to observe, what do I do reflexively, instinctively, even without thinking? What do I do with my hands? Uh, what do I do with my feet? What do I do with the muscles of my chest? That's the stuff where people can start noticing things that they would be better off doing the opposite. Very good. Now, it probably seems a little scary at first uh, for people to think about doing the opposite. Um, but what is, what is this really about? 
doing the opposite. It, it, it's about this. The anxiety disorders, they're all counterintuitive problems. Uh, they're counterintuitive problems and people are trying so hard to use an intuitive solution. And that's why they get such poor results. So a, a, a counterintuitive problem. Uh, you, you, you get a new puppy and you bring him home and he gets off the leash and he runs down the street. He's running away from you. How are you going to get that puppy back? Well, you might think I got to chase that puppy down. But you know what? He's got four legs and you've got two. That's not going <laughs> to uh, what, what would be the opposite of chasing that puppy down? Yeah, like calling him and having some a, a treat and letting him come running back to, to me. Well, that would be different. That would be like 90 degrees yeah. different. What would okay. be 100 degrees? Uh, not chasing him at all. Well, that might be 100 degrees different. Uh, <laughs> what, what's the opposite of chase of running after the puppy? Oh, uh, the already, uh, turning around and, and walking home. Oh, uh, well, it might be 130 degrees. You're getting close. Uh, <laughs> running home. <laughs> the opposite would be running away from the puppy. Yeah. Uh, because then the puppy's going to start playing chase, chase the owner. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the, the puppy will chase you and everything will end nicely. Yeah. Uh, you're at the beach. You're halfway out to the water where you want to swim and a big wave comes in. And, and you don't want that wave knocking you down. What should you do? Should you run for the shore? That's probably your gut instinct. No. But no, you run for the shore, you'll be taking a mouthful of sand pretty soon. Right. Uh, what would be the opposite of running away from the wave? Diving into the bottom of the wave. Oh, that's it right. Yeah. 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 There, there are counterintuitive problems in life. There's not a lot of them. Most of our problems are... are capable of intuitive solution. But there are these kinds of problems where our gut instinct creates more trouble and we need something very different. And those are two counterintuitive kinds of problems. The anxiety disorders are all counterintuitive problems. That's what rule of opposites is really about. Very interesting. Powerful, powerful rule. Okay, now you're talking, now you're on to chapter four, giving us just a little taste of what's in your next chapter. Yeah, yeah. And, and chapter four is about uh, our, our gut instinct is always to try and protect ourselves, that we tend to take uh, the fact of feeling afraid to mean I'm in danger. If I'm afraid, then I'm in danger. And, and that's probably often true. Uh, but is it always true? Is it something that we can rely on? Uh, and with anxiety disorders, we can't rely on this here. It's the hallmark of an anxiety disorder. I, to feel afraid when I'm not in any particular danger. Uh, that, that's why people want so badly to get over this, why, why they come and seek help. Uh, so if I have an anxiety disorder and, and, I, and I'm aware of this and I, and I realize I wasn't actually in danger, how do I stop myself from being afraid? Well, that's the tricky bit. Um, what you want to start with is not trying to not be afraid. Uh, you want to start with not protecting yourself. Uh, you want to start with, let me allow myself to feel afraid while I refrain from protecting. And the protecting you're talking about what we started out with those safety behaviors, ways yes. of right. Yes. Uh, because of, of course it's our gut instinct when we feel afraid, we you know, we want to treat that like a danger and then run away or fight it off. I mean uh, this is the traditional fight or flee. Um, when we think of anxiety as an enemy, that's what we got. We either run away from it or we fight it off. That's all we have for enemies. We fight them, we run away from them. Uh, when you come to see that anxiety isn't so much an enemy, but simply a, a strong, uh, unpleasant emotional experience that I need to juggle and, and handle, uh, that's the path out. It isn't that I have to get rid of the anxiety right away. It's that I need to refrain from the protection. And, and the better... So, so, why, so, 
So are yes. you saying if, if I am having an experience, I have an anxiety disorder and I'm having an experience of, of anxiety or panic, are you saying that at that moment, it isn't important for me to try to stop the anxiety that I'm feeling? Not only isn't it important, it's probably unhelpful uh, because we don't have pinpoint control over our emotions. Uh, our, our, our emotions and our sensations are, are kind of stubborn things. The more we try and tell ourselves, don't be afraid, uh, the longer that feeling of fear is going to persist. So uh, should I be doing the opposite? Should I be, yeah. should I be feeling it instead? Yes which ultimately that's what exposure and response prevention as a form of treatment is all about. Uh, let me work with the feelings rather than against them. Uh, because it's when people get into a fight with their anxiety, uh, that's what makes it a chronic problem because they're continually uh, trying to resist and struggle and arguing with themselves. And, and you know, a person arguing with himself well, that's such an evenly matched contest that can go on forever. Uh, so people need to get away from uh, the protecting and come to see anxiety as something I have to practice with rather than protect against. I like that phrase, practice with the anxiety instead of protect against. Yes. You know, when you, you look at the kinds of things people come in, uh, you know, to, to see a therapist, uh, what, what what are the problems they're coming in about? Um, well, nobody has ever come to me and said, you know what, uh, Dr. Carbonell, I'm afraid of jumping into the lion cage at the zoo. Can you help me with that? Uh, people realize that's not a good idea. I don't want to do that. Uh, by definition, they come with the things that they recognize in some gut level. I'm getting more afraid than is reasonable here. That would be a useful activity or object or place for me to be if only I could get past this fear. Uh, so just by stepping in the door, people are kind of noticing mm, the fear I'm having about this, whether it's driving or flying or public speaking or whatever, this fear is not giving me a useful signal. Uh, the signal of protect, that's unhelpful. I, I'd be better off practicing with this than protecting. If something is dangerous, nobody asks me for help with that. They, you know, if it's dangerous, you stay away. Protecting against danger, that's a good thing. Protecting against the, the discomfort of anxiety, that's a bad thing. Very good. And, and it's a bad thing because it leads to more fear and avoidance. So that's uh, the, the, the central material of chapter four. Um, <clears throat> oh, well, and, and uh, uh, towards the end of chapter four, then we have a very specific set of steps because people are going to wonder, well, okay, that, that all right, that sounds like a good idea. I'll practice with anxiety instead of protect. Uh, uh, Dave, do you have any ideas of what I can do while I'm feeling terrified? Uh, and yes, that's the aware steps. So can you uh, say just a bit about the aware? Yeah, yeah. Aware, AWARE is an acronym, you know, I'll, I'll describe them very briefly. Um, they're on my website uh, as well as in the book. Uh, five steps, okay, maybe I'm uh, experiencing a panic attack in the mall now, but let's suppose. Uh, oh my God, what should I do? And instinctively, the first thing that occurs to me, let's get the heck out of here. Let's, let's run for the exits. Oh, AWARE steps, acknowledge and accept is the first one. Uh, acknowledge in this sense, okay, I'm, I'm panicking now. I'm, I'm feeling really freaked out right now. Uh, I'm going to acknowledge that. I'm not going to try and ignore it. I'm not going to try and pretend it isn't happening. Uh, don't like it. Don't want it. Don't deserve it. But okay, that's the current experience I'm having right now. I'm feeling very afraid. I'm going to acknowledge it. Uh, and I'm going to accept it as part of that, and that first step. And that's kind of using that rule of opposite because that isn't what my gut, gut instinct is telling me to do. Yes. Yes. You know, if I could only tell you one thing, you know, if I was only allowed to say one thing to, to clients coming in looking for help, uh, and you know, insurance companies are working on that idea. <laughs> uh, if I, I could only tell you one thing, it would be the rule of opposites. Uh, it, it's an excellent guide. And, and so the second part of that aware step 
uh, except, uh, okay, uh, terrible feeling, don't like it, don't want it, don't deserve it, and I'm not going to resist it. I'm not going to struggle against it. I'm not going to get a bottle of vodka and try and drink it away. Uh, I'm not going to run away and, and try and, and treat it like a, a mugger. Uh, I'm not going to ask the DD to intervene and, and remove it from me. Don't like it, don't want it, don't deserve it. And if this is what I have to feel right now, I'm going to let myself feel this way for a little while. And I can leave. Uh, leaving is always an option, but let me postpone for a few moments the decision about whether or not to leave while I go through the steps, give myself a little time to settle down here. That would be, that's acknowledge and accept. Oh, wait and watch is the W. Uh, wait in this sense, don't just do something, stand there. <laughs> Can I hear that again? I love that. Don't, don't just do something, stand there. Don't just do something, stand there, because this is not an emergency. When a fire breaks out, there's an emergency. There's stuff we got to do right away. This is not one of those. Uh, this, this is I'm all freaked out and, and nothing to do. Uh, so let me just hang out here. Let me buy a little time, remind myself of what's going on, get more into the observer mode. Um, I can always take action if I need to, but right now there's probably no action I need to take. Uh, certainly not running away or resisting or struggling. That's wait. Uh, and, and the other part of W is watch. Watch what? Uh, watch myself. Uh, what are the thoughts that are running through my mind? What am I doing with my hands and my shoulders and, and my breathing right now? Uh, the more I can observe what's going on, the, the better I'll be able to guide myself. And this is counterintuitive also because people often initially, they, they would like to get rid of their thoughts. They're afraid of their thoughts, but we want to observe all the symptoms because uh, it's on observing the symptoms that we can learn how to respond differently to them. So, so maybe another start. example of, of your rule of opposites, uh, instead of trying to get rid of or stop my anxious thoughts, to kind of do the opposite and acknowledge and observe and notice them. Yes. Yeah. And, and the ultimate of acknowledge and observe is I ask people to fill out a questionnaire when they're having a panic attack. Uh, uh, and it's got a bunch of questions on there. Rate the panic on a scale of one to 10. What scary thoughts are you having? Write them down. Uh, what instinctively do you think you want to do right now? Write them down. Become a better observer of, of the experience of the attack. That's what's going to help you make better choices and come to learn to handle it better. Uh, so that, that would be the opposite of, of trying to get it out of my head. I'm literally going to answer some questions about it. Yeah. And it's interesting, Pe people don't like the idea initially of, you want me to fill out a questionnaire? What are you, crazy? Uh, they, they're not fond of that idea. Um, but it's so interesting. What do you suppose happens? Sooner or later, most of them try it. What do you suppose happens when a person who's having a panic attack begins to fill out the questionnaire about the panic attack? Well, they're not uh, frantically doing things to get rid of the anxiety, and they're not rushing to protect themselves and they're being an observer. Yes. And as a result, the panic attack begins to subside. Yeah. It's so interesting. You know, they're, that, not, again, feeding that, it. they're not feeding the panic. That's right. That's right. But that, that's such an opposite uh, result. You know, they were thinking, gee, if I think about it more, it's going to make me worse. Actually, when you fill out the journal, most people find uh, that the panic begins to subside more promptly. Uh, so that's acknowledge and accept, wait and watch. It, it's kind of a version of count to 10 before you get angry and tell somebody off. Uh, now, in the middle, uh, might be an appropriate place to take some action. In the middle, if, if you jumped into action right at the top, it would increase the chances that you would get fooled and do something counterproductive. Uh, so we've, we've postponed action to the middle here. And, and what kind of action do people need here? Well, so this is the second A in aware. Yes. Yeah, and it's in the middle for that reason. We, you know, it's okay. better if you wait a little bit before you jump into action. Okay. And I want to do an action that's going to be uh, 
instead of going north, going south, doing something that's gonna actually be helpful to my recovery in that moment. Yes, yeah. And, and so an interesting question to consider here is, um, uh, well, if you're having a panic attack, literally, uh, I'm gonna ask the client, what, what do you think is your job when you're having a panic attack? Well, my instinct is I gotta get rid of it as quickly as I can. That's what my exactly. gut is telling me. Exactly, I gotta make it stop, I gotta make it stop. Uh, and so, uh, here, this gives me a chance to deploy a, a really classic dumb guy kind of question. Namely, well, client, have you ever had a panic attack that never stopped? Uh, and well, duh, Dave, unless they're having one right at the moment, apparently the answer is no, all of them have stopped. <laughs> uh, and, and you know what, as we explore the history with it, people have come to realize, gee, all the panic attacks that I ever had when I did everything in hindsight the worst way, when I struggled and, and got really upset and resisted and did all that, all the ones where I responded in the worst way, they all ended. And all the ones where I responded in the best way, they all ended too. Even the first panic attack a person has, maybe they don't even have a word for it. That one ends too. You know what? It's not your job to make the panic attack end. That happens regardless of what you do do everything the best way, do everything the worst way. It doesn't matter, the panic attack is gonna end. The end of a panic attack is as much a part of a panic attack as is the start of one. It's not something you have to supply. So don't, uh, so don't do something, stand there. Yes, exactly, yeah. And so then when it comes time for the action stage, well, what kind of action do I need? Well, it's very modest because what's my job it's not my job to make the attack stop. That's going to happen regardless. My job is probably something more like, let's see if I can help myself feel a little more comfortable or a little less frightened while I'm waiting for the panic attack to subside. Like maybe That's remembering to do those exhales instead of frantic yeah. trying to get a deep breath. Yes, yeah, a much more modest kind mm -hmm. of response because it's just about... Yeah, let's let's see if I can feel a little better while I'm waiting for this to go away because ultimately that's my job just hanging out and waiting for it to go away and, and how do people how do people come to realize that by looking at their own history and seeing yep yep they all ended no matter what I do the good ones the bad ones and everything in between um, but until people stop and consider this they, they tend to suppose uh, that somehow they have to make the attack stop. Uh, and, and that betrays them, that makes that leads them to have more trouble. And then uh, what's the R in AWARE? Uh, the R stands for uh, repeat. Uh, and that's a good thing. We needed the R to make this word work. Uh, R is just there to remind you, well, you know what, you might start going through the steps, feel a little better, feel a little better, whoa, and then all of a sudden, oh, here comes another wave of panic. You know, if that happens, it just means one thing, okay, take it from the top. Okay. Take it from, if we didn't have repeat in there, you know, when that happened, people might think, oh my God, it doesn't work, now I gotta you know, get the heck out of here. No, you might go through a few waves and just take it from the top, that's what R stands for. And the E is there as, as another reminder. Oh, uh, what's your job when you're having a panic attack? It's not to make it end. That's going to happen anyway. Uh, just that more modest job of, oh, let me see if I can help myself feel a little more comfy while I'm waiting for it to end. And what does the E stand for? Uh, that's that's about end. And, oh, remember, end. Okay. It know, ends yeah, by remember, Okay. It's going to end no matter what you do. So you don't have to break a sweat. You don't have to move heaven and earth to make it stop. That's going to happen regardless. Wonderful. So that's chapter four. Uh, oh boy. Um, as I look at each of these, I realize, oh boy, I, I could do a half an hour on this one. Um, here, here's a chapter devoted to pure exercise of worry. Uh, catch worry in the act. Help, you know, people get troubled so much by worry because they focus in on the content of their worry. Uh, what if I have a heart attack? What if I 
start yelling uh, at my son's teacher during that meeting. Uh, what if I fall down? What if I faint? What if I, uh, all these terrible worries. Uh, I, I want them to realize, gee, there's two parts to this sentence, this worry sentence. There's the what if part, and there's the content part. And you know what? The only part of the, the worry sentence that's really important is the what if part. Uh, the part that says, mm, here's something awful that isn't happening now, and why don't you pretend that it is? And, and the rest of the sentence, it's a fill in the blank. Fill in a catastrophe, any old catastrophe, they all fit in there because we got the what if part in the front. These are the, the Mad Libs of chronic anxiety, if you remember Mad Libs. Uh, fill in a catastrophe. So I want to help people get better at catching themselves in the act of saying, thinking, hearing those words, what if, because that's the, uh, the best indication they're going to get uh, that says, oh, okay, stand by for a bunch of thoughts about something that isn't likely to happen. Boy, again, I can see the rule of opposites in this approach. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, all through treatment, people, you know, uh, it's a sign of, of uh, positive feedback for me. People are always saying, well, that's the opposite of what I would have done. Yep, yep, yep. And then after a while, they'll start coming in and saying, so I got to think about what's the opposite here. It's such a powerful through line for people. It's so empowering. Uh, so catching myself in the act of those what ifs. I don't even really need to hear what comes afterwards to notice, okay, now, th this is like a salesman foot in the door technique. Uh, somebody calls you up and interrupts your dinner and says, oh, I have some free magazines for you. Well, if you hear free magazines and think, oh, a gift from a stranger, how nice, you're gonna end up buying a bunch of stuff that you didn't really want. And if you hear free magazines and realize, oh, okay, sales call, and treat it like a sales call, you're probably going to come out of that all right. It's the same thing here. What if it's an invitation to start thinking about stuff that's not likely to happen? And then so just getting up, catching on to that what if part, that's really all you need to do. Notice that and realize, all right, here's a bunch of noisy nonsense about stuff that isn't happening now. And should I pretend it is or can I let it go? I got Tic Tacs on the slide here um, because I ask, ask clients a lot of times to buy some boxes of Tic Tacs. Little, little candy mint comes, uh, I think it's uh, bottles of boxes of 60s and 100s. Um, I, I have no equity interest in the Tic Tac company, I hasten to add. Uh, I ask people to buy Tic Tacs because I want them to get into this habit. Each time they notice the what if thought, each time they hear themselves saying what if aloud, you get into the habit, open up your box of Tic Tacs and take one out. You can eat it, you can flick it into the street, it doesn't matter. Uh, you're just going to use that as a way of counting, paying attention to, noticing more often. How many times a day do I get these what if thoughts? And my what if thought is about as important as that one little Tic Tac. Yes, yes. And it's a nice way, kind of an idios idiosyncratic way of calling attention to it, get, helping me get better at catching myself in the act. Uh, there's another one. If I don't notice the what if part, if I, my attention immediately jumps to the rest of the sentence, what I like to think of as the catastrophe clause, well then I'm going to start getting all upset uh, with, within myself about this catastrophe that isn't actually happening now. Uh, the, real, the only important part of the sentence is the what if. Um, so I want to help people become good observers of that. Uh, sometimes people aren't so sure, gee, is this more serious than you're thinking it is or whatever? And that, well, then there's a, uh, a little two-part test that people can quickly deploy. Um, the problem that I'm thinking about, does it exist outside of my mind right now? Um, and if it does, is there something I can do about it right now? Uh, so if you get two yeses, yes, there is a problem outside of my imagination right now. And yes, there is something I can do about it right now. Well, then that's not a classical worry. You have an actual problem. Might as well go take the action that you can do to make it better right now. 
But if you get anything other than two yeses, well, no, there isn't a problem outside of my mind now. There might be tomorrow or next week or next month or next year, but not now. Okay, I got nothing to solve right now. I can treat it as worry rather than a problem. Very good. <clears throat> So, all right, that's uh, that's the heart of chapter five. Um, if people can come to realize, gee, what follows after the what if is usually a bunch of uh, let's pretend stuff that isn't happening now, uh, not important information, just uh, aggravation and incentive to worry to get embroiled. Well, then I want to have a little help people find a different way of relating to that voice of worry. You don't need problem solving with stuff that is uh, not about an actual problem. Um, and what we're going to gravitate to here is, is, can you find ways to humor these thoughts? If you can come to see, gee, this what if is not telling me anything important, well, then maybe I can I can humor it rather than getting involved in an argument with it. Last so again, that, that's another example of your rule of opposites. Instead of arguing with my worry or trying to banish it and get rid of it, you're saying, well, how about humoring it instead? Absolutely. And, that, and that's the opposite of arguing, humoring, you know, playing yeah. with it. Uh -huh. um, so, I, you know, and I, I have some suggestions in the chapters for very, in the chapter six of various ways people can do that, making uh, haikus out of their worry. Uh, making limericks out of their worry, um, people who are bilingual uh, or maybe only have, you know, maybe they had a year or two of high school Spanish or French, uh, I'm going to encourage them to worry in their weaker language. Uh, it just makes it a little easier to set it aside and notice, you know, in my clunky uh, uh, high school French or German, it, it just sounds different. People don't respond the same way. Um, how do you say choke to death in German? It doesn't carry the same punch uh, that it did before. So in all kinds of ways to, uh, to, to humor the content. Um, and the ultimate form of that I mentioned on the slide, your worry appointment site, uh, suggests to people ways to specifically set aside time to do their worry, to make appointments, two 10-minute appointments a day to, to spend with their worry content. Uh, and so then they can kind of give it a place in their day rather than always having it intrude. And then outside of the appointments, they can postpone to the next worry appointment. It, gi it gives them much more influence in terms of when and where do I do my worrying and therefore when and where do I do much less or maybe none of my worrying. So instead of spending my day fighting and arguing with my worries, actually in a couple of 10 minute appointments where I'm intentionally worrying. Yes, it, 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 it's like uh, the, the the office manager who has a bunch of people reporting to him, uh, and he or she also has their own work to do. And you know, if they leave their door open all day long, all their staff is going to come in and take up their time, so they never get their work done. And if they bar the door and don't let their staff come in, so that they can do their own work, well, things are going to go wrong out there because they're not providing supervision. So most good office managers, they set up certain times, certain times of the day, my employees are welcome to come in and sit down and tell me what they need help with. And other times of the day, unless the building is on fire, they need to leave me alone so I can get my work done. That's what worry appointments are about. All right, good. Uh, chapter seven, observe, don't distract. Uh, it, it's such a, uh, a widespread idea, so powerfully are people um, lured to this idea, if I can just distract myself, get my mind off it. Uh, they're always trying to distract themselves from the anxiety. And then two things about this, one, it, it genuinely doesn't work. Um, because if you tell, you know, to distract yourself, just tell yourself, stop thinking about that thing. Don't think about that thing. Uh, and the more you tell yourself, don't think about that thing, guess what? The more you're thinking about it. Uh, even if you think it's working, how can you tell if it's working? You've got to stop and consider, am I thinking about that thing or not? And now you're thinking about it again. 
very difficult to, to work with that idea of don't think about it. Um, there's also this about distraction. Uh, what does it tell me about a problem if I'm motivated to distract myself from it? I like to ask people this question or- Because or, um, I'm anxious. I'm anxious, yes. Well, that tells me something about me, but what does it tell me about the problem? Well, what if, it, what, if, if the building was on fire, would I want to distract myself? Yeah, and what do you think? Probably not, huh? You know, if a pit bull comes running down the sidewalk at me, getting ready to rip me apart, how likely am I to start singing a happy song? <laughs> uh, if you're, you're standing in line at a bank, and a, a bank robbery occurs and there's gunshots, how likely are you to pull out your checkbook and start balancing it to distract yourself from the gunplay? So what Not I'm hearing is that, 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 that wanting to distract myself is actually showing me in a way that I'm not actually in danger. Yes, yeah. Uh, the urge to distract is a powerful reminder, if I can notice it, that the chips are not down right now. Because when the chips are down, the last thing I wanna be doing is monkeying around with the thoughts in the back of my mind. I'm too busy out here using my hands and feet to make myself safer. If I can see I'm, I'm motivated to distract myself now, that simultaneously may be the, the best source of feedback I can get that tells me the chips are not down right now. Because if, if you know, the building you were in right now, suddenly you smelled smoke, you wouldn't be trying to distract yourself. You'd be doing whatever you had to do to be safe. And then so the urge to distract can uh, turn out to be a powerful reminder. Gee, this is uncomfortable. This is aggravating. Uh, this is very upsetting and in no way is it danger. That's why I'm motivated to distract. So that's a lot of what's in chapter seven is talking about this approach that's gonna help learning to observe using the aware steps and kind of the counterintuitive idea. Yeah. Well, yeah. if you've been yeah. using the, distraction, do the opposite. The, the counterintuitive idea of, of becoming a more passive observer of these scary thoughts rather than treating it like a call to action. Mm -hmm. uh, Mark Twain had this to say about worry. Uh, I've seen some terrible things in my lifetime, he said, uh, and some of them actually happen. <laughs> uh, chapter eight, uh, again with, you know, you can see this, the same theme of rule of opposites here. You know, let your support people go. Uh, gradually take them off the payroll. Uh, do more and more uh, with less and less accompaniment from your support person. And is um, that part of the safety behaviors that you started out talking about? It is, yes. Because okay. support people are very, you know, very powerful and prominent source of uh, uh, safety behavior. Um, and then how to support people work, it's really more what what therapists call an enabling process. They get to do the stuff more. They get to drive further and go at other things. And, and that's a good thing, but the price they pay is so high. The price they pay is continuing to see themselves uh, as people who can't cope. Um, so if and, I understand this and I'm, and I'm ready to start uh, letting my support people go uh, so I can build on my recovery work, how can I explain this idea? Do I should I have my support person read your book? Would that be one way of explaining it, or is there a simple way I could explain it? Um, well, they could read, they could just read this chapter. Uh, okay. That, that, that would be a nice uh, simple way to explain, or or even more to the point, um, they, they could summarize for their support person what what they've learned from this chapter. You know, hopefully that you know, yeah. Uh, I've, I've come to see, I feel more comfortable when you're with me, but then I kind of rely on you. And I, I give I give you the credit, uh, even though I actually did the driving, and even though I actually spent all the time in the store, somehow I come away thinking, it's only because you're there. And, and so uh, while I really appreciate the help, and, and it does help me feel more comfortable, if I'm gonna become 
more and more independent and, and believe in myself, I got to start have some, having some experiences of doing it on my own. Mm-hmm. That, that, that's basically the explanation. Um, and, and so, so important when this happens, uh, we don't want the support people to uh, take charge of this and begin to take themselves out of the situation. We want the support people to do that uh, in consultation with and in, at the direction of the client. That if you've come to rely on a support person, uh, you need to work out ways in which you, you can rely less and less on them, but they, they shouldn't run away from you. They shouldn't avoid you. They should work in concert with you to decide how can we cut back on this. The client Very needs good. to be so we have just a, a few more minutes. Uh, can we just touch a little bit on the other? I uh, think there's a few more chapters that we want to touch yeah. on. Yeah, same thing with support objects. You know, support objects work the same way as support people. There's just no opportunity for back talk. It's just stuff you carry <laughs> with you. Uh, and same thing, you want to gradually start cutting those out. Could you say just a word about smartphones? So uh, my smartphone, if I have anxiety, is probably maybe my number one uh, support (laughs) object. And all my friends all have their phones with them at all times. And are you saying that I need to be doing some of my activities without my phone with me? Um, Yes, that's where I'm hoping people will come to Um, because if you're somebody with panic disorder and, and keeping that smartphone with you, you have a different relationship with that smartphone than some of your friends who don't have panic disorder and, and just regard that as an object of convenience. It's literally injecting trouble into your life uh, by uh, leaving you to feel less reliable and less independent. And so, yes, you probably do need experiences of going into your feared situations. Uh, without that smart um, seems you know seems like a hassle and I guess it is but uh, this is part of the recovery process if I think my smartphone is saving me then I'm never really going to feel strong and independent within myself I got to see so that once again not- another illustration of your rule of opposites yes yeah uh, and the, the black, uh, chapter 10 um, this is about secrecy. Uh, so often people feel bad about themselves and bad about their anxiety and keep it a secret. Uh, and uh, the more people keep this a secret, the more ashamed they feel. And the more ashamed they feel, they're more likely to keep it a secret. And you know what? This all rebounds to your disadvantage. Um, so I'm uh, encouraging people, and I have some specific ways to, to think about doing it, to get your toe in the water on doing a little self-disclosure on, on breaking some of the, the, the secrecy about this because there, there's no great shame in this. Uh, this is an anxiety disorder. You can learn how to handle it and have it be less difficult to the extent people think it's, it's a terrible accusation or, or a terrible characterization of them that they have to hide. That tends to make the recovery process more difficult. And, then, and again, I, uh, Dave, I'm hearing again this idea of, of of kind of maybe the opposite of what my gut instinct is telling me. Yes. I, maybe I feel ashamed, and maybe that's what I'm feeling, and so mm-hmm. I'm keeping it secret. And you're suggesting, well, something that actually might help my recovery is kind of maybe doing the opposite of what I've been doing, and finding ways. And this chapter gives people a lot of really good tips. I think about how do I go about doing the opposite with people in life. Yeah, and, and assessing and making sure that, you know, I'm, I'm uh, doing something sensible here. You know, you don't start with your boss, you start with your best friend, that kind of thing. Uh, but yeah, across the board, it, it's rule of opposites is such a powerful, powerful and useful guide. Um, chapter 11, uh, control what I do, accept what I feel. Uh, People so often think, gee, I, I, I got I to gotta change what I feel. I have to become confident first. Uh, show me how to be unafraid, and then I'll get on the airplane. Show me how to be unafraid, and then I'll get on the highway. Well, we, we can do that, 
but not in that order. Uh, it's on the airplane that people will learn how to be less afraid, and it's in the car that people will learn how to be less afraid. Feelings follow behavior. Uh, so I'm not so, trying to control my feelings. No, just what you do. I get what to control do. my actions. I could choose actions that are going to yes. be. Yeah. So often people think of themselves as being out of control uh, when their behavior is perfectly fine. You know, a person having a panic attack in an office meeting, you know, they might come home and tell their spouse, oh, I really lost it. I was completely out of control. Uh, well, what did people do? Well, nothing. Uh, well, didn't they ask you why you were out of control? Well, no, they didn't notice. Why didn't they notice? Because what seemed out of control was my thoughts and my emotions. What I was actually doing, my behavior was perfectly fine. And control is about behavior. That's the only thing we can control is our behavior. We can't directly control the content of our thoughts. We can't directly control the, the nature of our emotions. All we can control is behavior, and that's what people should be controlling, not what they feel. So the feelings that I want to be having, feeling more calm, feeling less anxious, enjoying life more, what I'm hearing you say is, well, that's going to come, but that's going to follow as maybe a result down the road of the actions that I'm choosing today. Yes, yeah, that's going to be the last thing to come. And people understandably so much want it to be the first. And then that betrays them. Trying to have it first, uh, that's what makes these things more difficult. So it's going to come, but it's going to be the last thing to come. And in the meantime, what do you control? What you do, not what you feel, not what you think. Right. Right. Well, thank you so much for giving us a taste of what's in your book and sharing uh, these ideas uh, in a really practical and concise way. And uh, do you have your next slide that shows your website? Uh, oh, I got still right, another chat. <laughs> I'll just let that one speak for itself. Uh, Feel the fear and let it pass. Yeah, exposure is practice. It's not a test. And here's the slide uh, with my, my website and uh, my, so my anxietycoach.com. And the book that we talked about in this webinar is the last one out, Smart Your Anxious Brain. Uh, but I also want to let everybody know about your other books, which are also wonderful. Uh, and thank you so much again, and thanks everybody for watching. Uh, I wanna encourage you, uh, if you're on social media, uh, to like the webinar and share it. Uh, and again, feel free to email questions to webinars at adaa.org. You could write Dr. Carbonell in the subject line. So bye for now, everybody, and uh, we'll see you uh, at our next webinar. Yeah, thanks for having me. Bye-bye. Bye now.